we we go. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the September 2022 CSI Next Chapter meeting. Uh, I'm your chapter president, Mark Ogg. Very happy as everybody's able to join us from wherever you may be in the virtual world today. Um, <clears throat> today we have with us uh, Mr. Chris Bennett, and I have known Chris for several years now. Uh, Chris is a CDT. He is also the president of the International Society for Construction Sciences, as well the principal owner and president of Bennett Build. And um, Chris is uh, he is he is my go-to guy for for concrete, and I and I think uh, some of the people in this. I see on the attendee list, uh, very familiar with Chris. He is he is one of the experts in the industry uh, and a uh, leader in the uh, area of concrete consulting uh, and uh, brings a huge uh, wealth of information, uh, diverse resources, and a track record for delivering very high results. When I have a question on uh, concrete finishing, applications, different technologies. Chris, Chris is my go-to guy, uh, and he's been very helpful in a couple uh, couple projects that I've been involved in as far as recommending uh, different types of finishes and just technical things from a specifications point to, to, look, to look out for. So today's topic is uh, Chris is going to present to us building bad slabs. Uh, how to increase costs and reduce quality in polished concrete slab construction. And before we get started, I would just like to put, put out a huge thank you to our chapter sponsors for this year, uh, the American Woodworking Institute, Northern Facades, KM Architectural Consultants, and National Gypsum and ATIS. Without their uh, backing and support, uh, a lot of what we do here at CSI next uh, would not be possible. So with that, I will uh, let Chris take it from here and we will kick off our first chapter meeting of 2022. Chris, all yours. Okay, awesome. Mark, thank you very much. And to many, many old friends. Uh, well, friends, not all of you are old, you know. <laughs> uh, hello, and nice to see everybody again. Um, Catherine, uh, saw this well, very similar presentation uh, at Skip where I presented this year and asked if I might be interested in uh, sort of a reprise of it uh, here. And, and I gladly uh, accepted to do that. Uh, and then one of the great things about time, it allows for new development, more thought. And in the last few weeks, uh, especially uh, this topic, has been uh, bubbling up on social media and certainly with my day-to-day -day work. And so you're gonna kind of get a 2.0 version, sort of a new and improved. And uh, the, the, the premise kind of comes from this. It doesn't matter which architectural firm I go into, uh, which client I'm, I'm speaking with. Um, if, if they're new clients, they're kind of like, why is it A, that are, are topping slabs to receive polished finish or existing or new construction. Policy. Why is it that all the floors always turn out different? It's like we're, we have the same spec, but we're, we get a different floor all of the time. And I said, well, you know, if you, if you think you're getting a different floor all the time, chances are you're getting a different floor all the time. And that's kind of what we're going to go into today. Um, and uh, I, I used a story, um, kind of uh, parallel marketing, I suppose. Uh, so, so bear with me here uh, a little bit, um, because I want to go back into the good old days where cigarette uh, manufacturers um, marketed that tobacco use brought about with it health benefits, right? Uh, now, actually, nobody here at CSI Next is old enough, <laughs> I hope not, to, to remember when some of these uh, ads from the 20s and 30s were running. Uh, but there was a time when doctors would tell you, uh, not doctors, but uh, cigarette manufacturers, cigarette brands would tell you that um, it's not that you that tobacco is bad for your throat, but it's that uh, unclean, unfiltered tobacco from lesser brands, those, 
those, uh, those foreign particles that aren't tobacco, that's what's causing you to cough. Um, another one would be that if you're pregnant, you need to smoke cigarettes. Why? Well, because it's going to keep mama nice and thin, right? Well, perish the thought that a woman gained any weight during childbirth while, while caring for uh, the baby to be, right? Uh, and the other health benefit was that it would also create a smaller birth weight for the child for an easier delivery. I mean, just imagine that for a second. Try putting that ad in a magazine or on TV in this day and age, right? Not going to happen, not at all. But we have sort of a, a, a oh, I'm, I saw, there's a little backstory to this. So Linda Stanson, um, uh, who had asked me to speak at Skip when I said, what should the top topic be? She was like, I wanna see horror stories. I wanna see people under pressure and bad concrete <laughs> and, and hear stories and tales of weeks of RFIs. And, and, and then I wanna understand why it was like that so I can avoid it with my clients. Uh, thus that comment there. Um, and I, I would argue, uh, not that it's all necessarily malicious. Some of it's just been very organic market growth, but we have a very similar situation where the polished concrete industry is so far anyway on kind of the supplier side where we are fed a narrative that anything that is shiny is polished concrete. The only benchmarks you need in your specifications to protect the owners, uh, to reduce risk, hold on to contingencies, all that kind of stuff for your project team. The only thing you need to specify is gloss or distinctness of image gloss, right? The, the haziness or lack of haziness in gloss. The problem with that is that while, while it allows polished concrete, it also allows about 101 at least different variations of hybrids, clear coats, epoxies, acrylics, topical spray-ons, different types of densifiers, grout coats. You'll, you'll see this as we get into uh, the presentation here, the talk a little bit uh, deeper. But at the end of the day, as long as they can hit those aesthetic benchmarks, they sort of get the stamp of approval contractually, right? As a condition of the contract that polished concrete has been achieved. And uh, so we're gonna go into why, uh, you know, a lot of people think maybe polished concrete is an artisan sort of floor, and that's certainly part of it, but that kind of leads people to believe that it cannot be physically quantified, which is very, very far from the truth. So uh, we're gonna examine similarly how a lot of these um, the marketing messages that you'll get from some of the suppliers uh, and different brands are a little bit akin to uh, some of the cigarette manufacturers of the 20s and 30s all right let's see here versus drawing Okay. Now, uh, obviously, uh, as recently as, as the skip meeting, maybe a couple of people before, some of you might have seen this, but it's still a good reminder. We have four floors here. And what I'd like everybody please to do, uh, this is distance interactive learning, is look at these uh, four images, okay? Only one of them is polished concrete. The other, floors are uh, some type of clear coating. Now, maybe it's punch list time, uh, or you're trying to decide if somebody can go home with their crews and get paid, whatever it is, I would like you to visually inspect this and tell me which one is polished concrete. And just kind of make a little selection in your mind. We're not gonna vote out loud or anything like that. But hold that number in your mind, floor one, two, three, or four. And now here's the great reveal. Now, there's some giveaways that I see uh, up here on the acrylic sealer. You can see the roller marks. Like there's some, you know, if, if you know what you're looking for, some of these pop out really, really quickly. But if you don't know, um, 
uh, let's see, you've got a new project manager at the uh, architecture firm or, or the builder, and they're just sort of learning, all they're going to see is shiny concrete, right? And it's polished, or is it? So uh, it's just a, it's a good handy tool there to show that visual inspection uh, or just aesthetics doesn't necessarily mean maintain the idea of polished concrete. So what would, outside of aesthetics, some of these other performance benchmarks be? Well, in my mind, safe walking surfaces, that comes to mind, especially in this day and age with uh, baby boomers retiring, taking their disposable income and walking out and about. You want to make sure that you're not having anything as much as one possibly can anyway, that is uh, encouraging any sort of slip and fall scenarios, right? And then you've also got durability. And I would argue this is actually what most people, when they select polished concrete or when they're trying to talk a client into polished concrete, this is what they're talking about. And it might come across as low maintenance, easy maintenance, or someone has uh, hard wheel traffic and rolling loads, whether that be automated little Amazon uh, robots, or whether that is forklifts at a, you know, at your local hardware store, people very, very rarely say, you know, we're building this 400,000 square foot facility and man, it's going to take a lot of abuse. And the main thing that's important to us is that it's shiny. You know, I don't know, maybe, maybe those clients are out there. Um, but there's a presumed strength, durability, resilience, uh, that comes with polished concrete. And then lastly, uh, is maybe that artisan part, right? The aesthetics, but even the aesthetics aren't dialed into just gloss level. You've got color, uh, which might be integral color, a stain, a dye, some sort of colorant. You've got sand and aggregate selection exposure and uh, even the type of sand you choose is gonna change if a space feels very, very cool or very, very warm based on its own color. And then you have reflectivity, right? Then you have reflective. Oh, somebody's got a chat thing here. Please use the, oh, all right. I thought that was a question for me. Uh, and lastly, you've got reflectivity. So I'm not, saying that choosing a gloss level is not important. Uh, you know, a client might want matte finish or maybe they want super glossy. That still has to be decided and it needs to be a part of the contract, the specifications, but it is one of many things that you need to include to avoid substitution, weeks of RFIs and arguing over subjective aesthetics to see if uh, substantial completion for the polished concrete floor has been achieved. All right. Oop. Now I'm taking, uh, there are a couple of different organizations out there, um, at least for North America, that uh, publish different definitions for polished concrete. Um, Concrete Polished Council is, I'm guessing, probably the most well-known. Uh, a lot of their manufacturer members are very, very prolific with, uh, you know, whether it's at Master Specifier Retreat and their own AIA activities um, in promoting this idea of, of gloss level equaling polished concrete. Um, and, and let's look at this definition here so that we can see that. Right, polished concrete, what is it? It's the act of changing a concrete floor surface. Doesn't say how, just says you're changing the surface to achieve a specified level of gloss, right? Now it goes on a little further that it starts listing these three classifications. One is bonded abrasive polished concrete, which is what most would consider traditional mechanical polishing of a slab. Uh, then you've got burnished polished concrete, which is usually some sort of topical spray and then using some kind of um, uh, not quite, but almost 
a janitorial style pad to burnish that shine. Then you have hybrid polished concrete. Uh, and there's a lot of specifiers in this room. And uh, as John Gwills says, you know, words mean something. So what does hybrid mean? It means two or more of anything coming together. So basically, you know, it's not that they exclude polished concrete. They absolutely do not. Let me be very clear about that. But they also include topical varieties as well as any mixture uh, of, of those two. And as long as you're achieving a specified level of gloss, that is polished concrete according to this definition, okay? Now, earlier, the Concrete Polishing Association of America, their definition was uh, a little different. And while they still talk about gloss and reflectivity, they're very specific in how that is achieved and what that means for durability, uh, long life cycles. So how did we get from that to this? Well, we've got to go back in time uh, with Mr. Peabody, right? And around 2011, 2012, polished concrete was really starting to kick off, uh, at least in North America. And the market share that your coating manufacturers uh, were, were hemorrhaging was, was pretty intense. What used to be VCT, what used to be epoxy, what used to be uh, these different types of uh, resilient floor coatings, all of a sudden were getting ripped up and replaced by just that slab on grade or that slab on deck. They were losing market share to something called polished concrete. So what are they gonna do with all these coatings? What are they gonna do with all of these chemicals that nobody is asking for anymore? Well, <laughs> you join the polished concrete committee, you broaden the definition of polished concrete and you change the parameters, the benchmarks as to what does or does not constitute polished concrete. And so now we are in a situation where all of these less sustainable uh, and in many cases more expensive clear coatings are dubbed, marketed as, and sold to you along with specification uh, help and AIA credits and sandwiches and, and all of that as polished concrete, which leads us back to that first question, you know, that the architect asked me, why are all of my floors different from project to project? And I'm like, well, brother, because you're getting a different floor each and every time if you're only measuring for an aesthetic. All right. So let's move on here a little bit. Um, there's uh, a lot of specifiers that I still see that will have a specification that reads something like uh, choose one of three listed uh, liquid applied products, which uh, may also be a, a giveaway uh, as to what kind of floor you're doing. Um, because polished concrete is mechanical, not that you won't have a densifier maybe, or might even have some you know, guards or sealers at the end of it. Uh, and then it'll say, you know, finish to 400 grit, finish to 800 grit, finish to 1500 grit, whatever the case may be. Some of you sitting in this room might have specifications that sound exactly like that. And it's not a great idea. And this is why. 400 grit, 800 grit, just like level one, just like level two, level three is not quantifiable. It is not objective. It is very subjective. In fact, the term grit doesn't actually describe the type of floor you're physically handing to the client at all. What it actually describes is the size of the abrasive grain inside your polishing puck, inside your diamond tool, your, your polishing pad. And some manufacturers have very stringent um, requirements so that every single industrial diamond or piece of metal chaff, whatever the abrasive is uh, inside the matrix of their diamond tool is very strictly, let's say, you know, 400 grit. 
others will take the average of all of the sizes. However, obviously those scratch patterns are going to be different. Uh, you compound that with their different materials that the matrices are made up of. And that might be copper, it might be ceramic, it might be metal. It could be, uh, you know, different hybrid tools uh, have little bits uh, of each in there. You've got resinous tools um, and, and the shape of the tool itself, the speed you rotate it at, how fast you walk uh, on your trowel or your grinder, all of these things are going to impact the type of scratch pattern that you leave behind. And so just because something says 400 grit on the box, you have to understand that it's not going to deliver 400 grit. You're just requiring somebody to use 400 grit, no matter what those different variations actually do on the floor. Again, this goes back to why are all my floors different? I've got the same spec. It's, it's understanding that there are inherent variables, subjectivity. Now, we also talked earlier about um, burnishing as a type of approved CPC uh, polished concrete definition. Well, janitorial pads also can, become, also can come in a variety that are impregnated with industrial diamonds. So those big floppy pads that you'll put underneath your Zamboni machines, your burnishers, auto scrubbers, those can those share the same delineation of 200 grit, 400 grit, 800 grit, 900 grit. So somebody can read your specification, right? Choose one of three, finish to 400 grit, finish to 800 grit. They can topically apply uh, a clear coat sort of guard or sealer product. And as long as they're burnishing it, to whatever grit level with their janitorial style pad, they have contractually met the obligations of your specification and also not given you a polished concrete floor. It's a really neat trick. And uh, assuming you actually took it all the way to court, you can imagine uh, how that would go with Perry Mason and that's like, you know, did you use one of the three products that the specifier put in there? Yes, your honor, I did. Did you use a 400 grit pad? Yes, I did. And then the specifier comes back and goes, but that's not the one I wanted you to use. I'm, <laughs> you know, it's eh, not a good answer, right? Too many variables. Uh, now here's a neat thing. Well, I don't know, neat. It kind of depends on your perspective, I suppose. But we've talked a lot about uh, clear coat epoxies uh, and acrylics, different things like that um, being bug sprayed on. But this is a type of coating almost that comes originally in a solid form. So some of these tools over here, uh, I don't know if you can see my arrow pointer, but there's this uh, green guy here. That's one. Uh, Probably this one here too, although there might be something in it. that looks like a, a resinous pad. Um, this guy up here, that's epoxy, right? And even if there's diamond tools in it so that the manufacturer can put, you know, 100 grit, 400 grit, 800 grit, whatever it is on the package, the matrix itself is epoxy. Now in a solid state, uh, it's not a floor coating, right? But what happens to that epoxy when you put it under a grinder and let's say that grinder weighs 1200 pounds, you got 15 horsepower engine and that starts spinning. It's going to get really, really hot. And what happens to that epoxy is it gets really, really hot. It's going to melt and it's going to smear and it's going to put little bits of itself and little pinholes and cracks and a nice thin coating of, of shiny epoxy all over your concrete slab. You're gonna walk out there and go, oh my goodness, this floor looks so good. I can't wait to pay for this, it's amazing. And then six weeks later, you ask the question or your client does, where did my floor go? And again, you're in that same scenario where somebody has absolutely followed 
your specification to the letter, but still not delivered a polished concrete floor. All right. So now I want to do kind of a, a some a little horror story uh, that uh, this was inspired by by Linda asking for it uh, at the skip meeting. Uh, I want to share this floor with you. Um, and this is the whole floor looked pretty bad. Uh, this just happens to be one of the pictures I took, uh, but it was a new school, uh, private school. So uh, uh, everybody had paid a lot of money for things to go well. And this is the floor that the uh, builder and the subcontractor team turned in. And they also asked to be paid saying, hey, you know, we've done this, this, and this, it's time for you to pay us. And now we're going to get on to, you know, windows or walls, put it in the HVAC system, whatever it might be. And of course, the design team and the owner um, and my consultancy were like, uh, hey, that is, that's, that's a no-go. You know, we're, that floor is not done. It looks like you know, hammered dog doo doo. Um, wh what do you What do you mean you need to get paid? And they referred to the specification, and it's had you know a gloss level, DOI level, um, and so while you're looking at this floor and you see you know the efflorescence, lack of refinement, um, and kind of the garbage that it looks like, I want you to pay attention to what is right about this floor. So if you look up kind of at the top you'll see that there's actually pretty good gloss here. And you can even see a nice reflection uh, from uh, the, the corner there where the wall meets the hallway. Uh, in fact, in the old, one of my favorite things in the old CPAA language is that they had a similar sort of level system. And one of the benchmarks was that images in, in the floor would appear crisp. And, and that always used to tickle to me because I'm like, well, how, do, you know, how are we defining crisp? <laughs> you know? do, do we need to have a, a crispometer? Um, when, when do we know when we have achieved crispiness uh, of an image? And, and, and how do you enforce that? But on that premise, they wanted to get paid. And uh, if we had not submitted an addendum requiring additional benchmarks for the physical properties of that floor, we probably would have had to have paid them. Now, the good news is that they were able to come back and fix that floor. The silver lining to this was that the subcontractor was not actually trying to pull a fast one. There wasn't an intentional substitution. Uh, three or four years prior to uh, being awarded uh, this project, he had attended, uh, you know, some manufacturer training and got certified as, you know, uh, an installer. And that system was a topical sort of, you know, spray on some stuff. You burnish it to whatever grit so that you can get your gloss or your DOI. That's the way he had learned how to do it. So he really came into it. Now, should he have read the specs? Should he have read uh, you know, the, addend the addendums? Absolutely. Uh, but you know, contractors tend to kind of live in the drawings. Um, and so for, you know, he, he, hadn't, he hadn't read the specs, um, but he paid out of his own money to go get training to understand how to actually do it and paid for the, his own remote. I mean, awesome character. Uh, or else he had, you know, <laughs> a really good, <laughs> uh, a really good bid in that allowed him to do that. But either way, uh, we ended up not hurting the owner uh, so that they would come back and correct it. And uh, the next project that we used him on was in downtown New York for this swanky uh, Adidas store. And we had... Uh, Oh gosh, pourbacks, uh, existing concrete, polishable overlays, all sorts of stuff. And, and he knocked it out of the park there. Um, we had very, very solid surface texture grade benchmarks, great coefficient of friction. The concrete looked awesome. 
and there's at least you know one contractor uh, in the Northeast that knows the difference between topical zero uh, nine style finishes and zero three polished concrete. So how do you specify it, right? And this gets, uh, uh, it's on one hand, it's easy to do. On the other hand, there are, again, there are so many different ways um, to achieve something that looks like a polished concrete floor that you've got to be very careful. Um, I was talking with uh, uh, Keith Robinson. Uh, he and I <laughs> talk all the time about concrete, low carbon, polished concrete, uh, composite rebar, whatever it is. We're uh, kind of nerdy that way. And, uh, and he brought up uh, a great point that, you know, you also have to consider is the concrete in a plastic state or is it in a hardened state? Because that sort of changes things. And, and we're examining, because uh, he and I uh, both classify, we'll put kind of our silicate dry grind sort of polished concrete over in division 09. And then we put our wet uh, kind of silica based densifier stuff over in 03. We, we have different systems of doing that, um, but we both realize that, you know, not that one is good or bad, they just, they're different. And so they need to be in different uh, divisions, different areas. And if you were talking about division 03 polished concrete, it is super easy to, to quantify it. Uh, for anybody that has worked on Amazons here, you're very familiar with the mezzanine levels and they require RA, a surface texture grade, um, a physical measurement of the floor itself. Now, Amazon also cares about gloss and definition of uh, uh, distinctness of image. They also care about coefficient of friction, but they've got uh, the, the uh, subcontractor, uh, the build team has to have benchmarks for the surface of the concrete itself. Now, uh, do, 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 do. so I don't know if you, if you guys can see this. So this is the reference standard here. Um, and if anybody wants, I don't, because this is a Prezi, it's hard for, I can send you a PDF but it sends it in like a big, big page. And so all of these smaller slides become almost like microscopic, but I've got a PDF sort of condensed version of this presentation. Uh, so if you don't uh, get a screen capture right now of this, or if you can't write it down fast enough, I'll send that to you later. Um, but this ASME B46-1 uh, is, a, is, is a reference standard which tells you how to take surface texture grade measurements, whether it's for glass, whether it's for steel, whether it's for concrete, um, and then the image clarity value, right? Because you still have that aesthetic component that you're gonna want. You want a matte finish, semi-gloss, glossy. That comes from standard test method for instrumental measurement of distinctness of image gloss of coated surfaces. Now this uh, ASTM is actually the uh, wellspring for how a lot of the trade organizations will develop their own DOI uh, reference standards. But curiously, they always leave the part off about coded surfaces, which I don't know if that's on purpose or I'm just, I've got too much free time, but it is curious to me uh, that anytime this uh, reference standard sort of gets uh, a new bottle, so to speak, uh, that coated surface part, uh, and sometimes the gloss part always seems to vanish. All right, so uh, what is surface texture grade? Well, for concrete uh, or for any material, we're talking about measuring the surface micro texture, so the peaks and valleys and the variations. Um, and so uh, if you've got a thin coat of something on there, but you've got this, you know, uh, you know, all of a sudden it's the Grand Canyon and then it's, I don't know, Mount Vesuvius right next to it, aka a lack of refinement, again, on the micro scale, the profilometer is going to go, hey, 
nobody's refined this floor. It's just been coated. If somebody puts a dye into a densifier or into a sealer, sometimes that's very, very popular to do. You put in a little gray, a little black, and then all those little nicks and flecks and little pop-outs kind of, kind of disappear or get muted in the concrete, not because they've been refined and actually polished, but because it's got a little lip gloss on it. Um, and again, the stylus will be able to tell, you know, regardless of whether a sealer has been coated or not, what the surface of that concrete is. It, they are super easy to use. Um, there's a lot of different uh, models out there. They're inexpensive. Every architectural firm uh, should have one. Every builder uh, that is going to be doing substantial polished concrete work should have them. Um, we don't have time to talk about it today, but I also use profilometers for concrete finishing and placement, even if we're gonna have carpet squares go over it. Um, just so that there's some sort of uh, minimum for finishing. All right, let's see here. Actually, and I don't want to, well, I'll talk about this for just a second. Um, this project uh, had a lot going on. Uh, one of them was surface texture grade. This is downtown Union, San Francisco, zero change orders for the concrete scope. So not all of that is just because of polishing or whatever, um, but that was a huge part of it. And, uh, and this meant that the builder held on to contingencies, the owner, the design teams, the engineering teams, uh, everybody held on to their contingencies. Why? Because we quantified what we were actually delivering to the client, the physical floor itself, we weren't simply quantifying the light reflected off of what we were giving to the client or the quality, but actually the concrete itself. Um, again, wet process. This, <laughs> this caused a, a big stink on a couple of social media platforms a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, I, I believe that if you're dry grinding, uh, you know, you've got to use a grout coat. You've got to fill those, those pinholes because um, uh, you're not turning that, that crown back in, into a slurry. You're not uh, making the concrete back into a plastic state. And because of that, you have to use some sort of a coating. And so my argument was, if you're coating the floor, that makes it coating, regardless if that coating is blue or clear or red or whatever, right? Um, and so here at this project, obviously, uh, uh, a wet grind scenario, wet polishing turned out pretty cool. Um, yeah. And again, you don't have to use these exact micro inch benchmarks, uh, but you should be for a, a basic polished concrete, your minimum should be around, somewhere around uh, 30 micro inches. And I always do like a plus or minus five, plus or minus six, because <clears throat> I don't want to nail subcontractors to the wall. They need to have flexibility, uh, but they also need to be sort of a, around the mark, right? They still need to be delivering pretty close to target. Um, all right, let's see here. Floor finish versus finishing. How much time do we have here? 940. Okay, we're cruising along well. Um, this is super important. Um, a lot of people mistake polished concrete as a floor finish. And while it is a floor finish, right? Technically, it is a floor finish. This is the type of floor you're going to hand over to the client. Fine, that's the finish. But it's actually a degree of finishing. And I'm talking placement and finishing. It is refining the surface of the concrete itself to a higher and higher and higher degree to elicit whatever level of reflectivity you're going to, you're, you're chasing. Okay. What it is not is a floor finish 
that you put on top of concrete. Polished concrete is part of the concrete. It is not something you put on top of concrete. And you'll see this expressed in a lot of ways where maybe the builder wants to do the polished concrete floor at the very, very end uh, of the project, right? Before you're getting to open up the doors. Um, and while there are some cases that that makes sense, it's usually a bad idea because uh, then you start putting slurry and dust and, and silica and all that kind of stuff on metal and your glass and you've got to protect the areas. Um, and, uh, and I see a lot of architects as well that will, will say, hey, you know, this is the floor finish we want. And so they treat it like carpet or they treat it like tile or something as something that you do after your cast in place is finished. And cast in place is where all of your success or all of your failure starts. Um, in fact, for new construction, I do not have a second polished concrete spec. It's not needed. I can do all of it in my cast in place specification. Under hard trial finish, you can require your RA, you can require your DOI and all of that type of stuff so that you can do it uh, at, at time of placement and finishing. Um, now for a retro plate or not retro plate for a retrofit scenario, um, you would need to come back. And so you would need a, a second polished concrete specification for that, but they're not separate. They're not separate at all. And so if you go in there uh, you know, with Kieran seals, which it's not today's message, but they don't work very well to begin with. But if you go in there with the Kieran seals uh, and, and that kind of stuff, and you go in with your kind of perceived FF, FL levels for how, you know, we used to do uh, cast in place concrete for when uh, it, most of the time it was going to receive a floor covering, you're going to be increasing the costs. <coughs> it is much less expensive to set up your canvas and get it right the first time than it is to go fix a wavy, bumpy, chunky looking floor later. Um, one of the things uh, uh, that I see all of the time too, people will put in slag uh, in their polished concrete. Now, slag is a cool product. It's got some great ASR uh, resistance and um, long-term strength but slag is also very brittle. And when you put the weight of a grinder uh, or a trowel and those diamond tools hit those little pieces of slag, they shatter, they break apart. And that little space where the slag used to occupy inside the concrete matrix kind of sinks in. And so you get little cracks, little pop outs, little divots. Uh, slag also encourages uh, shrink. So you'll get additional cracking. And so when you're trying to chase that monolithic kind of, uh, you know, you know the, the floors that only exist in renderings, <laughs> which isn't exactly true, but uh, <coughs> kind of a joke. Um, if you put slag into a system like that, again, you're introducing change orders. So there's a constructability to polished concrete um, uh, that requires not a lot, but some material science as well. Um, you can read some of these other no-nos. Uh, don't allow a, tr a hot trowel to sit on curing concrete. You'll have differential curing and you'll leave a little, you know, cat whisker pattern of the trowel blades uh, behind you. Um, nine times out of 10, if you're doing a topping slab, unbonded is better than bonded. Concrete needs to move while it's curing. There will be some amount of volume change. Um, and builders a lot of time, uh, engineers for structural reasons, right? They like to reinforce everything. And uh, some things that's obviously the case, but for a topping slab, most of the time it's just leave it unbonded, let it move a little bit. And while the concrete is, is shifting and changing, uh, don't have you know that uh, immovable object with the irresistible force and you'll have a lot less cracking as well. Let's see here. Um, um, ah, here's a good one. Hand finishing. 
if you're going to have a polished concrete floor, a lot of times your subcontractors, um, if they're doing just a standard cast in place, they're going to hand finish around all the columns and around all of the edges. So here's a question for you. Is the PSI, the pressure that they're able to do as strong as they are, as uh, manly or as womanly as they are with a hand trowel, is that going to be leaving the exact same surface as under, underneath, you know, an eight foot, 10 foot, you know, ride on, or, you know, even a, a walk behind power trowel? And the answer is no. So if you've ever wondered why you kind of have almost like this framed sort of edge in your concrete where it's a little lighter, it's cured differently, that's because it's, it's showing all the areas in a polished concrete floor where someone hand troweled. They make, lot, they make these little um, uh, uh, walk behind uh, edge trowels and you can make sure that the blades underneath those edge trowels have the same PSI as your big uh, ride-ons or your walk-behinds, and all of a sudden, your field and all of that work around the columns and edges looks identical. Why? Because the same pressure, right? The same pounds per square inch. The same thing that you're doing uh, to the middle, you're doing to the edges. Uh, prohibit re-entry corners, good luck. Design teams love weird shapes. Um, <laughs> but when you get weird shapes, as you see here, make sure you're kind of cross hatching, uh, your rebar there, uh, to provide, it won't prevent all the cracking, but it will reduce the size of the cracks. Uh, maybe some of the cracking. Um, okay. So sort of closing here, um, much like cigarette manufacturers kind of telling you, hey, smoke cigarettes, it'll make you skinnier. Uh, yes, that is true. You know, it'll, it'll make your baby weight go down. Yes, that's true. But not telling you the other part, like it's also bad for you <laughs> and will kill you and your family. You know, um, you have to look at things holistically. Um, and and you go, well, polished concrete and cancer, boy, Chris, that's kind of a stretch. And on, on maybe that humanistic level, the health level, yeah, I would agree with that. On the other hand, you have hundreds of millions of square feet of concrete that have to get redensified uh, sometimes three times. You've got the change orders, you've got weeks upon weeks of RFIs and arguing and people settling and not understanding what's going on. Um, and it costs hundreds and hundreds of millions. Of, there's a whole industry <laughs> around it. And so to say that it isn't a big deal, isn't giving it fair enough weight. Um, so some of these benchmarks today that we've gone over, uh, and maybe even some of the the idea is that, hey, we need to classify things a little bit uh, more accurately are going to help you in not only making sure the outcome is actually what the client wanted, but you're going to be able to control your costs. You're going to be able to reduce your, your own risk and the risk, frankly, of the whole project team, as well as provide, uh, I think, some much needed wayfinding for the people out there busting their butts day in, day out, physically on the slab. You know, if you give them kind of loosey goosey, uh, excuse my language, you know, turd language, um, uh, then that's kind of what you're going to get. Uh, a contractor friend of mine last week, uh, what did he say? It was on LinkedIn. Uh, because the moral of the story is specs suck, they're never enforced. So, we just decide whatever we're going to do with the GC and try to do a good job, right? And that's, for the most part anyway, that is, that is the state of a lot of exposed concrete uh, floor finishes, polished, clear coat otherwise, in North America. Um, it's super easy to do better. 
Um, you need to also make sure that if you're putting in any of these requirements, that you have to do a little bit of your own quality assurance. Um, a lot of the uh, quote unquote polished concrete products that you're probably very used to might not be polished concrete. They might have a densifier component, but you can even apply a densifier as a coating, right? Polished concrete is mechanical. There's again, constructability issues. And you might end up hurting some people's feelings when they used to be, you know, your favorite in zero three, but you need to protect the owner. So they probably need to go to zero nine. Um, and, and again, it's not like one is good, one is bad, but you need to be able to compare apples to apples, oranges to oranges, that kind of thing. Um, let's see, it's 9.52. I'm gonna stop here a little bit in case anybody's got some questions we might wanna do, or if Mark, you need to uh, do anything, anything else, but. Uh, uh, no, Chris, uh, thank you as, as always, ma'am, great. Great presentation, great information. You you always uh, have a knack for bringing the uh, the de the details to light and how they <clears throat> how they how they really matter matter because I think all of us here know um, that the devil is in the details with what we do, whether we're architects, specifiers, uh, construction managers, uh, subcontractors. We we all know the devil's in, devil's in the details, and I, I think this was. This was excellent. Um, opened my eyes to a couple of different things that I've seen in the past um, and will definitely know to avoid in the future. Uh, we do have a couple questions here. Um, <clears throat> first one looks like it surrounds uh, quality um, control. Um, well, quality assurance, quality control. When testing the, and I can't read Chris, Forgive me if I'm wrong here, but I think it was the was it the RA factor? RA, which yeah. stands for average roughness. I don't know why the letters are backwards from <laughs> what no. it is. I was not in charge, yeah. Uh, but yeah, surface texture grade is, and the mathematical measurement is called average roughness. And don't ask me to give you the equation for it, um, but it's a stylus. Um, that's one of the ways you can also put down their optical kind of laser ways of measuring RA. You can put down a film of something and kind of take a plaster mold and measure the RA later. But for what we're talking about are pretty inexpensive field devices, anywhere right. from 750 to $10,000, depending on what you want to spend. And you put the stylus device, uh, you calibrate it, calibrate it, calibrate it. Uh, that's super important. Uh, make sure it's in micro inches, not micrometers. Um, and then uh, you take your measurements um, and very, very quickly, uh, you'll be able to see if you're kind of, you know, within that 30 micro inch range or 20 min inch micro inch range, wherever you've specified it to be. Okay. And in regards to another question popped up in, in regards to that, when, when that is verified, when that is, that is, check looked at it at the at the time of installation is that typically something that is specified to be done by the installer or is this something that would fall under um, some of the outside testing requirements that we normally see owners absorb the cost on so they would they would bring in an outside firm um, is this something that's normally done by the installers with with verification from the from the contractor or the administrator, or is this something that's done by an outside firm typically, or is it a combination? Or? Sure. So number one, a uh, good question. And that is because I forgot, so I'm, I'm, I'm a, uh, I represent owners. Uh, and one of the big things we do is risk management. So a lot, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of being right. The, the proverbial hammer. So everything I see is sort of a nail and, uh, and what I mean by that is it's great to test. And to your point, uh, yes, the owner can hire somebody like myself uh, to come out. Uh, and there are plenty of other testing agencies while they're, you know, they've got their dipsticks and they're doing FF, FL, or somebody's coming out and doing coefficient of friction, you can have them do RA as well. 
Um, and, uh, and, and not that Amazon is the only person uh, that requires RA. Uh, all of the work I do is RA. Uh, uh, everybody, it's becoming more common to have it. But Amazon, I would say, just because of how, how prolific in the scale, they've certainly elevated RA in the industry. Um, and, uh, but if I'm a subcontractor, Mark, I would, I would have it anyway because it's going to help me with my costs. My, if, I, if I come to a new slab, I show up on your job site and I'm bidding against other people, I can take measurements of the floor and go, oh, okay, cool. We're at 80 micro inches. Now I know that maybe I don't have to have a more aggressive diamond tool pass. If another subcontractor doesn't come out there, they're not, they're going to, it's kind of, they're going to be in the dark, like, well, maybe we'll go ahead and start heavy. So then they submit their bid, right? And they've got an additional diamond pass, maybe two in there. And the guy that went out there and actually quantified something is going to have more precise numbers for their labor, the time they're going to require materials and things like that. Um, and so it's a very useful way uh, for subcontractors uh, to stay lean and on target of their own costs and not just kind of spinning their wheels. Um, and, and, if, and if let's say a, uh, I've seen it sometimes where a specifier will say, you know, thou shalt start at 40 grit, which is ugh, a, a bad thing to start, <laughs> you know, uh, section three with anything kind of means and methods. But if the subcontractor can go, look, you're asking me to use a diamond tool that's going to put us at, let's say, 200 RA, but the floor is already at 100 RA. Why are we going back? Now that contractor can introduce those savings to schedule and budget and look like a hero. So it works both ways. Great. Great. Um, another last question we got here uh, right before we wrap up. Um, is it possible to get uh, an email presentation of this or I'm, I'm sorry, an email presentation, an email PDF uh, of this presentation? Um, and in relation to uh, certificates, uh, I believe there is a post webinar um, survey uh, at which you can put in your uh, AIA information or whether you need a certificate and that will be uh, that will that will be sent sent out to you so uh, if it's Chris if it's possible to get a PDF of this um, we can send it out to all our attendees here today uh, I've got that list um, if that's possible so uh, it is so um, and like I stated a little bit earlier I can get a PDF but in Prezi the software I'm using it's going to present it as one big field. So what I have done is created, uh, following the timeline of the presentation pretty closely, <coughs> sort of, I'm, I'm calling it a polished guide, but it's got all that information and it's kind of in a bullet point format, you know, without all of the, you know, metaphors of cigarettes and all of those uh, highly, highly interesting stories I told. Uh, so it's, you know, just the facts, ma'am. Um, and I'm happy to share that, uh, with you guys. Um, and, um, uh, yeah. Great. Great. Well, we are right at the, uh, one hour limit. Uh, again, thank you, Chris. Great, great topic. Great information. Um, uh, for everybody that is still on the line, thank you for attending our first chapter meeting of 2022. Um, uh, be sure to check us out at CSI next. Dot org. That is our chapter website. Our next program will be October 20th, uh, where we will be discussing cost-effective high-pressure laminate facades, and that will be one week after the uh, conference in Denver. So if anybody here is uh, planning to attend, look, look forward to seeing everybody in Denver in mid-October, and have a great rest of your day wherever you are. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Nice to see Thank you. you.